global, global challenges. And certainly right now, our connection is through a visiting professor who has a tremendous amount of expertise in the issues facing us with food. Will there be enough energy? Will there be enough water? And how will it all fit together to feed us? Today, she is going to be talking to us with her expertise of coming from 33 years of working with USGS. She developed a model, ModFlow, that is worldwide known and used. And for that and many other things, she has been truly honored by her peers, many scientists around the world. She is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. She's a fellow of the Geological Society of America. She won a prestigious prize, or rather was designated as the awardee, for uh, a prize that was given by UNESCO, the WMO, and the International Association of Hydrological, Hydrological Sciences called the International Hydrology Prize. She is presently at the University of Kansas in the College of Liberal Arts, where she is a professor. And it's a great honor to have her be a visiting fellow with the school. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that we will take all the questions through questions and answers, a little box you may see, or a little um, emblem down at the bottom of perhaps of your screen. And the chat will be disabled, so put your questions there. And we'd really like it if you could put your questions with who you are and, and your name. Uh, the, Somebody just asked, will this be recorded and uploaded? Yes, it will. It'll be available, I believe, on YouTube, and somebody will correct me if that's, that's wrong. Uh, and I think we will be stopping, uh, Mary's gonna stop partially through her talk to answer questions and then stop again. And so we'll have two opportunities perhaps to ask her about her, her work. So Mary, welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. Um, so I think what I'm supposed to do at this point is to share my screen and start my presentation. So I'm going to do that. Hopefully this will all go well. And uh, welcome to everyone who's here. I'm, I'm excited to talk with you. Okay. Uh, Futures is focused on resilient farms and thriving communities. It's uh, funded out of the Infuse program from the National Science Foundation. Um, and for this talk, I chose the title, Innovative Solutions for Sustaining Rural America. Um, during the talk, you'll see me mention um, some of my many uh, collaborators um, from University of Kansas, Kansas State University, Washington State University, and Western New England University, as well as other locations. Okay, the general framework of the study and the talk is um, uh, to first discuss the problem of uh, increased agricultural demands and challenges. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our regional test bed for investigating these problems. That is the Central Arkansas River Basin, which you will see called CARB. Um, um, it allows us to investigate challenges common to semi-arid agricultural landscapes. 30% of agricultural lands in the world uh, are arid or semi-arid, so there's a lot of applicability. Um, there's also applicability to other kinds of farming. Um, uh, the hypothesis is that new renewable energy supported technologies um, uh, can be used to produce transformative opportunities for small town and rural communities and economies. Um, the approach that we're going to be taking is to, first of all, emphasize local stakeholders, farmers, local energy executives, um, um, and other people who support the farming community. Um, um, we're going to use, and then we're going to use model abstractions and metrics to develop user-focused decision support system for two innovative opportunities for these landscapes. Um, and that will be uh, um, for what we're going to investigate our water treatment or local scale and local scale ammonia production. 
I wanted to just say the reason, one of the reasons we're really looking at the stakeholders is that adaptation to future changes have to be, you know, the, the burden of them is largely on local stakeholders. Um, if they aren't uh, motivated to make those changes, they aren't going to get made. So, but they need a way forward. Okay, the basic problem is the expanding uh, global population is increasing pressure on non-renewable and difficult to, to renew resources such as water and energy and on limited resources such as land. This pressure threatens global food production, making food uh, the principal challenge uh, facing the world as we go towards 2100. And we need innovative solutions to make the adaptations required to sustain human well being and dignity. This is a slide that my colleague Vincent Amanor Boadu uh, 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 provided for me um, and shows the, who's an, and he's an economist at Kansas State University, um, showing the unfolding population reality. Um, in both the developed and uh, uh, the developing world, and um, also the situation in global population densities. So you can see the trends that have brought us to our current point continue forward, largely. And behind these growing populations are death rates and birth rates that are changing with time, and these changes are part of what needs to be adapted to. So the basic problem is there's never enough food where it's needed the most. High population areas often depend on food from imports. The U.S. has been a major source of global food supply since the end of World War II, but its ability to continue performing this role is threatened by its own increasing resource constraints uh, in the main agricultural food commodity producing regions of the country, such as the Central Arkansas River Basin. Um, the uh, main uh, U.S. agricultural food exports um, ca are categorized as shown here, bulk commodities, intermediate, consumer-oriented, and agricultural-related. You can kind of see what are included in those. And then if we take those four categories and look what's happening, um, this is over time the U.S.'s contribution um, to uh, a, a, the, the U.S. Agri, uh, um, exports. You can see that they were going up fairly rapidly uh, between 2004 and 2008. There was a little dip. They continued to go up, but they've been fairly flat since then in pretty much all of these categories. Um, and every state contributes to this. Here's the Kansas share. So even Kansas, um, contributes fairly large percentages of that agricultural export for selected kinds of products. Okay, so to investigate those problems, we selected the Central Arkansas River Basin as our area of interest. There's a little map on the right showing where that is. It's basically the Arkansas River Basin from the front range to where it starts getting uh, more precipitation and includes parts of Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. Um, there's a lot of civet center pivot irrigation as shown on the left. Um, each center pivot requires 400 gallons per minute or 91 cubic meters per hour and a cubic meter of water weighs about a ton. That'll come in later as well in this talk. Um, so that's a, a, a lot of tonnage of water. It's a lot of water. And that's each center pivot irrigated, each irrigation, each circle you see there, uh, average size, size circle. And on the right is what the center pivot structure looks like after the water runs out. Um, Okay, this area is water challenged. Um, it uh, depends, has depended for a long time, for decades, on the Ogallala Aquifer. And this shows uh, the declines in water levels that have occurred in those areas. And um, um, the declines have been a substantial portion of the thickness of that aquifer. Uh, it's also an area with uh, extremely good wind power and decent solar power uh, for renewable energy. 
So what we're interested in doing is could the right set of technologies uh, using local energy to address local agricultural challenges be used to enhance competitive food production in the heartland and improve its socioeconomic viability so it can continue to feed the world. Futures proposes to explore alternative designs of energy microgrid uh, solutions to recycle water through water treatment, thereby reducing pressure on the Ogallala and other uh, natural water bodies and produce ammonia for energy storage and fertilizer. Graphically, that looks like this. On the top right, we're trying to produce uh, opportunities um, for uh, new local businesses, improved resource use, and enhanced local economies. And we're doing that um, uh, as shown in the diagram using, using the water treatment, which is on the, the left of the agricultural, green agricultural plant panel, and then ammonia synthesis, which is on the right. We're taking the energy from local generation and the grid through electro microgrid technology that can optimize the use of that electricity for all these different demands. The water that's coming in could be surface and groundwater could be brackish, the brackish water, uh, water and water produced by um, uh, oil and gas production. Okay, so that's that's our basic thing. We're evaluating can this can can these pieces be put together in a way that produces profitable uh, circum uh, circumstances that can again both produce food for the world and support these local economies. Okay, I'm gonna stop here if there, to see if there are any questions. And I can't see the questions, so. At present, Mary, we do not have any questions. Okay, that sounds fine. So I will stop in a little while again. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to go into a little bit of depth on these three topics. Um, each of them is going to have three slides. And um, uh, the first one is going to be about ammonia production. And that work has been primarily done at Washington State University with Ria Mohammadi and Peter Fromm. And um, there's been a growing interest in um, ammonia as an energy vector, a hydrogen for its hydrogen, um, and as well as for fertilizer. Um, um, and in Australia, uh, there's been an almost million dollar award to invest to, uh, for a solar ammonia plant. In the US House of Representatives, the, um, in January, a draft of the Clean Future Act had ammonia and hydrogen listed as options. Um, on the left, um, their ammonia is being produced at a farm in Iowa to supply 10% of energy and fertilizer. Uh, they have a 320 acre farm and um, the folks doing this are in the bottom right hand corner of that image. Um, the uh, ammonia is also being uh, investigated uh, to power an ultra large container ship um, by Dahlia Shipbuilding Industry Company and Man Energy. Um, and um, recently, uh, uh, Siemens in the UK, uh, you can buy an ammonia production facility. There's a picture of it that'll produce 30 kilograms per day. That's 109 metric tons per year. Um, and to give you a, a, an idea that 109 metric tons, I have a little note on the top left of this slide that shows that it takes about a thousand tons of ammonia per year, ammonia being NH3, um, to fertilize 11,000 acres of corn. So this facility is enough to, uh, by, by Siemens, is enough to uh, fertilize uh, about a thousand acres of corn uh, every year. Um, and uh, also Tyson Krupp uh, has produced a small scale uh, modular system for ammonia production. And I'm gonna, t this figure uh, is nice in that it shows some of the basics of ammonia production that I wanted to get across. So I'm gonna put that up next. 
Um, and um, all I really want to point out here is um, um, that um, there's water that goes in. There's water that goes in and um, um, it goes through electrolysis and um, uh, that requires the most electricity. Uh, then there's the ammonia synthesis part. It takes the hydrogen that's produced from the hydroly hydrolysis, gets nitrogen from the air uh, to produce ammonia, and then you get uh, uh, carbon neutral ammonia in the end. Um, uh, it requires a little bit of water, but it's a small amount. And um, um, I'm not going to go into the rest of the details on this slide, but you can look this over and basically see that the amount of water for this process is very small relative to the, um, excuse me, relative to the, um, amount of water that's used for irrigation. Okay, um, if you add the economics to this, the main thing I wanted to point out here is that um, ammonia, the production of ammonia requires about um, that, that number in the middle, the th about 30,000 joules per kilogram uh, ammonia, okay. Um, then the ammonia can be used for all the things over to the right. It has to be transported by rail or truck or um, uh, pipelines. It has to go to markets. It goes to markets and, and there's you know, profit in that market. You can also, any extra ammonia you can keep um, and, and it's an energy storage mechanism. Uh, each uh, kilogram um, when, when burned essentially um, produces about 10,000. So if you can sell that electricity you generated from the energy, if you can sell that uh, back onto the electric grid for three times, at least three times more than what you got it from, um, you can make money just that way. And um, anybody who knows about the energy market knows that there's a lot of times that energy can be um, uh, uh, sold to the grid at much higher prices than than at other times. Okay, so just that's the only thing I wanted to point out here. Okay, so then I wanted to just say a little bit about water treatment. And again, these are fairly uh, dense slides, um, but I'm gonna go just make some very selected points. And this work is mostly by Peter Fromm from Water, um, Washington State University and Ted Peltier from KU. Okay, and what I wanted to point out here is, again, we're using renewable energy off on the left. Um, we can add a, sta a trigger for when we use the electricity that it has to be a low enough price. Um, here we have water treatment um, that requires a certain amount of electricity. And then um, that water treatment produces usable water. Okay, that the incoming water is the unusable water sources from the bottom, the saline, water, the produced water from oil and gas, high nitrate groundwater, and high sulfate water. Um, and um, of that unusable water, 90% of it, once it's treated, is usable, and 10% of it is brine that has to be gotten rid of. So then there's the issues related to uh, that disposal and the expense related to that disposal. You can avoid that disposal by going with a zero liquid discharge process where you keep reprocessing that brine um, to get uh, um, um, uh, just solid minerals that come out, can go to the landfill, and some, there is some value to some of those. There's some magnesium and other things in there that can potentially be um, uh, sold and be a source of income. Um, okay. And just to give you some numbers, um, that treatment of water for irrigation that um, uh, uh, with hopes of using it for um, irrigation scale, um, uh, the cost of that treatment, and I'm just going to go to the colored numbers here, 
are about $500 per acre fee if you dispose of it, um, uh, if you produce a concentrated brine, and about $815 per acre foot otherwise. Uh, if you if you go to the zero discharge desalination, the second option that I talked about, um, um, the result of that being that that's really only economical for selected high value uses, like maybe growing tomatoes. It's not going to be profitable for large scale field irrigation, like growing wheat, uh, and that's not a surprise. But we now have numbers connected with that, and um, uh, that, that we can uh, use in our decision support framework to help uh, stakeholders evaluate these options. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is the decision support system to give you an idea of it. And there's a number of authors uh, listed here from um, KU, Western New England University, KSU, um, University of Colorado Davis and University of Colorado Boulder. Okay, this is um, a program called FUCALC. The articles are um, uh, uh, um, in review and this will all be available publicly and freely um, once it's, uh, it's what, once the articles are published. Um, and this is an agent-based model. I know it looks really complicated and, 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 and busy, but mostly I just want you to see that on the left, um, there's a section at the top for agriculture. So those are inputs for the user for agriculture. There's inputs related to energy. Um, there, on the bottom left, there's inputs related to water so, uh, so choices. And on the right, scenarios, uh, climate scenarios. In the middle, there's something in agent-based modeling world called the world. Um, and that provides an animation of the things that are happening. And um, you can see that um, there's um, uh, uh, the crops that are being grown. There's an indication of whether there's insurance that's been claimed. There's uh, icons that represent solar panels and wind turbines. Um, and then on the far right, a bar that indicates how much electricity relatively are produced by these, those two kinds of renewable energy. And then there's also something that, that reflects the amount of water, um, impacts on the water, both the amount of water in the groundwater system and um, contamination in the surface water system. Um, and then on the right, you can see there's results for agriculture, both uh, crop production and income, energy, um, there's impacts on the water and on farm economy, and then we also included crop insurance. So um, in, within futures, we, this would be sort of a beginning conceptually, and we would be providing something, again, that the users, the farmers, or whatever can select different options and see what the um, consequences are, are likely to be. Um, okay, and this is, these are results related to agricultural consequences of climate change without adaptation. And you can see to begin with at the bottom left that already historically, um, uh, making, a money, making money in farming has become pretty difficult, largely because the prices have be, are quite low. Um, 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 you can see the kind of counterintuitive thing too that although with dry, with dry land farming that occurs in this simulation at about 2060, um, um, the uh, production goes down, but the income actually goes up, and that's because uh, the expenses have gotten such that it's too expensive really to 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 irrigate. Um, and what would have really happened along the way is the farmers would have made, made a adaptations. But we're assuming this is without adaptations, the far farmers just using present strategies to go full steam ahead. Um, and then on the right are results for uh, a more serious um, climate scenario. Okay, um, so that's what where we are and what we have so far and how we've thought about it. You can see there's a lot of different pieces coming in. I tried to give you a little bit of, of sort of insight into what's behind the ammonia part, what's behind the, the water treatment part. Those things haven't been added really to that, um, 
uh, to what I had just shown you for the decision support system. So we'll be adding those in, um, making it easier for the user to uh, 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 to um, work with the tool. We'll also be adding connections to global stresses besides climate change, also pricing changes, and try to look at worldwide dynamic economic dynamics um, and what are likely to be um, uh, those trends um, for prices and other uh, things that occur on a global basis. Um, okay. And there's a few other things on this slide. There's an article at the bottom. Our, um, our resilience team is going to is working on developing um, uh, um, metrics to try to make it so the results encompassed in this model are really accessible to the stakeholders involved. Okay, so this is another place I was going to stop to see if there were any questions. Yes, um, we have one and one's being typed uh, and one this one has come up before this is this one is Dave Wilson and he's just curious about why ammonia production particularly um, we know it's the obvious fertilizer uh, value but is there something specific about a particular place that would want to produce this ammonia? A particular place? Well, a particular um, reason, particular reason. Oh, particular reason. Yeah, yeah. Amount, it's, it's really, it's, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. Um, one is that ammonia tends to be, right now, tends to be kind of monopolistic in that, that it's kind of a monopolistic market, so the prices tend to be high. That gives us enough room to work in that we could make ammonia at local scale with local involvement. Um, and have them much, have local farmers much more invested and able to invest in in that kind of technology. Basically, that technology for getting smaller scale ammonia plants has advanced a great deal. And if you combine that with the presence of um, renewable energy locally, it provides opportunities that haven't happened before. Um, and it's all it's for the ammonia. And again, and it also has the nice aspect of it's not only ammonia for fertilizer. But it's also almost, it's it's a storage, it's an energy storage mechanism. So um, um, so that so but is that? There's a question it, also from the University of Cincinnati, from Dion. He asked, uh, in the water treatment for various uses, what other parameters does the analysis consider? Does it consider, for example, water quality besides total dissolved solids? Yeah, I just use total dissolved solids because it's a it's a it's a easy metric to to get oriented. Clearly, there would be other metrics, and that's particularly true if you're trying to use produced water from oil and gas development. You need to look at other things as well. Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Okay. So. Um. Um. Uh. So this is a. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is uh, the futures system with really an emphasis on end users. So again, I'm showing the energy production at the top, and then the water treatment would need to be mobile. Your water is very heavy. You're not going to be transferring it around a lot. Maybe we'll get to where we have, there's talk of various, of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, um, pipeline systems related to water, but mostly for now we use it where it is. We would have to take the treatment to the water. Um, uh, and there's an example for ammonia tanks and things like that. Okay, again, the op we're looking for opportunities, new local businesses, improved resource use, and enhanced local economies. And that can be, is, is available because of all those user, uses of these things at the bottom. Again, uh, um, on the left, you're seeing the energy and the water go into irrigation into homes. You're seeing the energy and water go into industry, and you're using seeing the fertilizer go into into the ammonia go into fertilizer and fuel for vehicles, and also fuel for homes. So, as a possibility. Okay, so just an overview there. Um, our takeaway: um, we seek to provide stakeholders with decision support tools that assist them in their own situations to 
assess components of the food energy water technology interactions needed to understand the ongoing feasibility uh, of ongoing technical operation and um, economic choices and i put ongoing in there twice because people are constantly making choices seeing how it works out the feasibility suggests not just feasibility for tomorrow but for five years and 10 years uh, on down the line and trying to get that insight. And then also uh, th that decision support tool is a way to engage partners um, to the stakeholders in conversation to discover viable opportunities. Um, and we're doing that via advisory groups, um, surveys and interviews. And um, Bill Gray, uh, BJ Gray and um, Amber Campbell of uh, Amber is from KSU uh, are participating in that. Um, we're developing um, decision support systems um, so stakeholders can identify. And I put best in quotes because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> um, uh, to to invest in for profit and or community economic development. And of course, we're trying to support the broader objective of securing the heartland future and feeding the world. Okay, we're hoping that this research produces wind energy designs that prove more profitable than current systems, that it creates opportunities for economic development in our small towns and rural communities. And economic feasibility depends on that operational feasibility. The, the, the devil is always in the details. <laughs> you know, what barriers stand in the way of adoption? And Jim Boyd, good at KSU is helping with that in the business school what regulatory challenges exist and what enabling policies are needed to advance operational feasibility of these things. Um, Susan Stover um, at KU is uh, very connected to the Kansas political system. We're interested in getting involved, um, getting closer contacts with political systems in the other states we're working with. Okay, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And our contact information is on the bottom right. Okay, so. thank you very much, Mary. That was very good to hear. And we now have a, several questions that um, maybe we're going to be brought back to the main screen. I'm not sure what, what's oh, happening. Yeah, I can, I should be able to get out of here. Um, let's see. Um, so. Well, even if not, oh, I have to stop sharing. No, just getting out of my presentation wasn't that enough. Okay, oh, so we've got some questions here, and I think there's some more coming in. I don't know if you can see them yet, but um, okay, so I'm seeing one from Garrett Robertson. Do you think yeah, that this Garrett has two? I see here, maybe three. Oh, I see two. Yep. Um, do you think that this model can be adapted to an indoor farming setup for use in an urban setting? Would it have the same feasibility assuming a more centralized approach to renewable energy? Um, uh, the, um, the basic framework for developing a decision support system of carefully going through the science and technology of a certain circumstance and then looking at the economics and the social impacts and, and working with stakeholders all of that has you know very broad applicability um, if you're talking also about the more detailed part the analysis of the water treatment or the ammonia production um, uh, one one thing that comes to mind is is those facilities can be fairly small um, so uh, i don't know if like right downtown urban setting but maybe suburban setting um maybe urban setting if you could put something on a roof or something i don't know um but it's interesting um and let's see uh let's see one from ryan Denny. okay i just got i had not realized you had gotten rid of one so I, never, never mind so okay so ryan deming um i don't know where you're from but welcome um, is the idea behind this research to help farmers create systems in which they can have new revenue streams via energy production, ammonia production, as well as lower their expenses, purchasing less fertilizer, purchasing less energy? Um, um, the purchasing less fertilizer is a possibility. They probably end up 
purchasing more energy uh, to you know for these activities um, but those if so that's those activities would have to be profitable to them obviously for them to pursue that or uh, relative to other alternatives um, so I mean so uh, um, I, so yes, new, so, so not just, so new revenue streams, new economic activities. Um, so both new expenses and new revenue streams with the goal of being profitable. Um, yes. Okay. Um, I hate that I can't get a response, but that's how this works. Okay. Does this model, does this model have a, future in an urban setting. I think that we have kind of addressed that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was from Garrett Robertson again. So if, if you wanted something additional, I'm going to need more guidance. Um, Sanyo Omocha, um, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation, um, environmental econ student at CSU. Excellent. Um, we see major issues in rural communities being comfortable with large payments mostly because they lack capital and already have major ag debt in most cases. What solutions to this initial capital barrier has your team discussed? Um, that's a great question. Um, and um, actually it's sort of interesting relative to me, who uh, an academic who doesn't deal with big agricultural equipment and stuff, I think of this almost as the opposite way, that these are people who are used to dealing in big, relatively big dollars, relative to me anyway. And um, that uh, certainly uh, some of these expenditures would be larger than they're used to. And some of, so for example, the ammonia plants, but even though they're relatively small scale ammonia plants relative to the really big ones that, that make ammonia now, um, they still produce more ammonia than probably a single farmer would use. So then one of the, obviously one of the, uh, the uh, ways of doing that would be, be to form farmer co-ops and they, they would be combining resources. Um, so, uh, but I, I find farmers to be, in, the ones I've taught are largely very savvy uh, economically. <laughs> and as I say, are actually used to spending a fair amount of money. Uh, on on the things they pay for, um, so I don't I, I haven't seen this as seeming so foreign to them that the amounts of money uh, uh, are feel so completely impossible. On the other hand, there's absolutely a lot of debt, and um, farmers right now between the prices and stuff, they're stressed. They're stressed already. Um, they're also really looking for solutions. So. Um, uh, so a tough time also, I think, uh, motivates people to seek solutions. Um, uh, so it's a dynamic situation, and hopefully this decision support system would help them understand some, op some alternatives they might have that they might not have thought so much about otherwise. Samuel, I hope that addresses some part of your question. And I now have... Dionysus, um, Dionysu, sorry again for the name, University of Cincinnati. Um, thanks for the presentation, thank you. Um, it looks like this is an interesting analysis with systems and input from stakeholders. What challenges do you experience while you are implementing such analysis, coordinating so broad topics? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of moving parts, um, and um, that's real. I mean, this is in a nutshell what our challenge is, right? Um, is, is trying to take knowledge that's in scientific and engineering communities and bring it into the world of the decision makers. Um, um, of the agricultural decision makers so that they, they become more facile with it and, and again, are, are at least informed about opportunity, what, what we think might be opportunities and have, at le have a really solid economic analysis so that they have an idea of what's worth looking at. So, um, great question. Here's a there's another question. 
Okay. What effect might this system have on the threatening uh, issue of leaching? So, um, and I'm assuming you mean soil leaching and degradation of soil quality. Um, so that's how I'm going to address it. If you want to clarify it, that's fine. Uh, and this is by Garrett Robertson. Garrett, I think we should talk sometime. Anyway, um, uh, um, <laughs> he just said yes. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, our so soils is, is a huge problem, and obviously there's there's a there's a real movement on for regenerative agriculture and really building soil health, not just sustainability, but but building more, um, building. Uh, uh, improve really improving the, the soil and I think we we have to do that I go to meetings where they talk about that a lot and and they always often talk about that they don't want to use fertilizer at all on the other hand um, I think something like 30 percent of the nitrogen in people's bodies now comes from fertilizer you can kind of detect that from from um, isotopes as my understanding um, so it's a without fertilizer we don't have enough Food to feed people. Um, so, so I, so what you know, so there's, there's this um, enriching the soil is absolutely critical. It's probably in truth going to be done in combination with using fertilizer um, and um, cover crops and you know all sorts of things are are very important in all that. Um, clearly, we haven't taken that to be you know the issue we're going to talk about. We're going to investigate here. But we're very uh, aware of it and are very supportive of those farmers who are really who are working on that. And in Kansas, at least, I don't know what's in Colorado, but in Kansas, we have something called Tech Farms, um, and I think there's like I don't know, maybe 20 of them now or something, um, where different farmers work with the um, state agencies and, and and scientists from local universities. From the state universities, um, not just the state universities, private too, but anyway, um, uh, to, and and just try new things on their on their land, and again, cover crops, just different kind different kinds of seeds, different all sorts of different sorts of things. So, uh, and we are regularly in touch with them, and the one of the guys with the state who works with the tech farm in in Kansas, but who works with the tech farms is the most is on our advisory. Is in our advisory group. So, um, great question. And please contact me. Yeah, let's uh, ask you a question to follow up on that. Who funds the tech farms, or is this volunteer? You're saying some are doing seeds and other types of things in these tech farms. How how do they get funded to do that? I think there. I think there's. Um, I I I can I can find out for you. Um, and I'll be getting to talk to you this year since I'm on sabbatical <laughs> at CS in Sojus. But I can um, uh, my 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 perhaps inaccurate understanding is that there is some money that comes from the state. That there's also they help them write grants to at USDA um, for for some things. So I'm sure the money is not generous, but the farmers are really looking for solutions. Um, they're they're dying out there. I mean, <laughs> they're having a really tough time. And when they have a tough time, eventually we will all have a tough time. That's yeah. our food. So um, I have um, another question that goes along with that. Um, you know, when you, when you were discussing the the part of the model where you're talking about the brine and the uh, what you do with that and how how that is taken care of. Is there a concern that there could be too much produced of brine or any other pollutant or whatever, and then that would, then you'd have to go back to regenerating what's on top of the soil again, or regenerating? I'm sorry, the last part. I, I didn't. I understood the first part, but then uh, generating. What's in on other the words, you have to be very careful about the water and what you're doing if you've got all this brine in it. Does it yeah, just salinization? Yeah, salinization. Yeah, the soil salinization is clearly a problem. There's a um, 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 so that's why you obviously you have to get rid of the brine, okay. uh, and we don't have an we don't have a nearby ocean right, to just dump it in. So that's why um, uh, in in the in the central Arkansas River basin. You really have to think about injecting it. Obviously, in 
ejection of water can cause earthquakes. We've seen that readily, but there's a lot of water, water that's injected um, that has not caused any earthquakes at all. So um, it's a, um, there's a lot of injection wells um, and that can be used and it's, just, it's a cost to the system um, that is brought in and, um, uh, and yeah, I mean, this is one of the things you can do with water treatment is um, address the pro problems of areas where you do have salinization problems of treating some water, getting it clean enough to help wash out the soil. And then if you can dispose of that brine. So there's, that's, uh, um, uh, we're, um, um, that's, a that's a type of circumstance we would evaluate and we probably, f we, f we will focus on um, specific applications to try to find out if under what circumstances water treatment could be profitable. Okay. You have another question, I see. Okay, I see. yeah, from Dave Wilson. Is there a different cost-benefit analysis if water is f sourced from surface sources instead of groundwater, or, or it doesn't matter? Oh, it always matters. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, the thing is that you, uh, the surface water is all allocated already. So if we're going to add water to, if, if we're talking about trying to add water to the system, we have to use water that's currently unusable. Now there is some water in, in the Arkansas River that's pretty dirty. Um, and so there is the possibility there of using surface water. Um, and one of the differences is it's gonna have a different kind of chemistry. Uh, for example, it tends to have uranium in it um, versus the groundwater that tends to, from the saline aquifers that tends to have more typical geologic saline characteristics. And then if you're using produced water, the produced water has already been taken out of the ground by the oil company. So that's a reduction in your cost, but it has special things in it <laughs> that, are, that, that are hard to get rid of. And that's an additional cost. Um, on the other hand, the oil company has to, they've taken it out of the ground they have to, if you don't, if we don't take it to treat it, they have to inject it somewhere anyway. So we might be able to get that water. There's, there's a lot of economics, as you say, cost benefit analysis behind that. Um, so um, it matters in terms of the characteristics of the model, some of the costs in that cost benefit analysis. That's how it comes in. Very cool. Okay, let's see. Any more questions? Well, Mary, I want to thank you so much. This has been very enjoyable to learn about this. Uh-oh, Garrett has another question. Okay. Uh, speaking of economics, are large corporations like Bayer and Monsanto involved in this kind of system? Um, they, obviously, they're involved. It's, it, there's uh, another one that you might mention is um, uh, Coke Industries. Um, and um, they, uh, so yes, these, uh, the, comp the companies are involved in, um, and, and you also saw that when I was talking about ammonia production, you saw me list some very large company names worldwide. Um, so they are involved and indeed, especially with ammonia, there might there would be some challenges related to that in establishing smaller scale systems um, because some of the, some companies are so large in connection with that. Um, so I think those companies, if we demonstrated that there was profitability available, um, uh, I think big companies tend to get interested. Um, and um, so we'll see if we produce results that interest them, or if the local farmers are able to get it off the ground, get some things off the ground independently. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, I mean, I think of it as we're sort of reimagining the economy going forward and hopefully an economy that um, will be more sustainable with our environment. Um, and so in that general sense, 
I think a lot of big corporations are very interested, um, partly because those corporations are starting to be required to put to to estimate the value of their of their environmental um, risk and put that in their prospecti. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, so in a general way, yes, they're interested in this kind of system, um, both from a profit and a risk viewpoint. Um, but we haven't had, I mean, I don't know, for the specific things we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, water treatment and, and such, um, uh, we haven't talked to them. So I guess that's what I'll say about what is a very good question. Yes. And uh, Nicole, uh, let's see, it was one by, okay, Nicole Marsasovsky, nice last name. Um, thank you for the email invite. I was able to meet with everyone earlier. There was no sound. Oh, there's no sound on my end at the end. Is there a link? Oh, okay. She's having troubles that Laura, I think you would be involved with. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, and it, it's one from Samuel. Um, perhaps not easily answered in Colorado and a lot of the West, heat waves and drought are a massive issue already. Can drought heat problems impact this process? Does it require a particular climate for any reason? Uh, but I don't know what you mean by this process. You know, that could, I, I don't know. Um, um, uh, um, but if it's the pro, uh, the process, certainly it impacts the process of trying to make projections because things are changing. And as you say, we're seeing it clearly already. Um, um, there is no, there's nothing in what we're doing that requires a particular climate. Indeed, I would say that what we're trying to do is create resilience so that the community and the economy can deal with those climate changes as they occur um, and make it, um, you know, give them options that they don't have now. So maybe they can still like, make a living and still produce agricultural products. Um, so the idea really is to put them in a position to address, the, uh, uh, to adapt to those climate change and those un un unknowable to some extent climate changes um, yeah, more readily. So, okay, thank you again. It's one of a good thought to leave things on. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Diana. Okay, bye-bye.